My name is Leisha Getson, and I will be your host. Before we begin, just a little housekeeping. The presentation will last about 40 to 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. You should be able to hear me and the speaker, as well as follow the PowerPoint presentation. To the right of your screen, you will see a chat box. If you have a question, type it in and submit it, and we'll get to as many questions at the end as possible. If for some reason you get cut off from the webinar, don't worry. The webinar will be archived on our website within a day or two, so you'll be able to go back and take a look at it at your leisure and see the PowerPoint. Okay, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Meg Dayak is a licensed professional counselor, educator, and workshop leader who has explored pathways to emotional well-being as well as the holistic impact of vibration, energy, sound, and music for over 30 years. Much of her practice centers on working with motivated teens and adults wanting to become more calm, focused, productive, and happy. And that sounds like something everybody needs, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule, especially at this busy time of year. I think it's a, a much-needed topic. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Okay, yes, so. Let's get started. Whenever let's you're get ready. started. Okay, so we're here to talk about natural ways to overcome anxiety and depression. And I want to start by saying I am not anti medication. I'm just saying that's not the first place you want to go. There are times when medication may be needed, but very often um, there are other places to start. So let's start with depression. And how do I know? Is it depression or just the blues? Well, we have to look at things. Depression is considered a mood disorder that lasts for a while. It lasts over a considerable length of time, generally two weeks or more. And it's characterized by a profound overarching feeling of sadness and a significant loss of interest in things that used to be enjoyed. Our moods are, are affected by many factors, our circumstances, our thoughts, our diets, our beliefs, our levels of activity. Sometimes we're in a depressing situation. You know, this is a picture actually taken from the Great Depression. Mm. And so can you think of anything that was more a situation that you just don't see an end? It's hard to see yourself getting out of it. We all have our own versions of the Great Depression, a life challenge at times where we see no way out. Mm -hmm. And having that sense of there's no way out, that takes us into that feeling of I have no control. And one of the, we have basic needs, and one of those basic needs is to feel some control in our lives. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we're in a, depress a depressing situation and it goes on too long, then our brains kind of forget how to make serotonin. That's the feel-good chemical. And now we're talking about clinical depression because now we've got a chemical imbalance because we, our brains have a, a delicate balance between three neurochemicals, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. If you change one, you throw off that delicate balance. So if your serotonin is off, that's going to affect the other two. And as an aside, that's why medicating someone for depression is a real art, a real challenge, because if you make an adjustment to one neurotransmitter, the others are going to be impacted, and then you have to adjust again and again and again until you find the right cocktail, so to speak. Now, when we talk about grief, um, oftentimes I hear somebody will come in and say, oh, I'm... I'm just depressed. I'm just so depressed. And I said, well, what, what's going on in your life? And what really has happened was that there was sadness, a loss. And that loss, if it goes on for a long period of time, can turn into a clinical depression. 
And then we have Outlook, you know, Eeyore. He's that sweet but gloomy character yeah. in Winnie the Pooh. And he expects the worst and he carries himself with that expectation. And believe it or not, how we carry ourselves can pull our moods down. So um, there's a great uh, comic, uh, Peanuts strip, that uh, Charlie Brown is standing. And I, I couldn't find it for the PowerPoint. Um, nor did I have the rights to it. So, but Charlie Brown is standing with his head bowed and his shoulders hunched forward, and he says, "This is my depressed stance." <laughs> you have to be able to really, to really get a good depressed stance. This is what you have to do, and how you can't stand up straight and lift your head because that's going to take away the depression. Yeah. And there's an there's an honesty about that that. As we carry ourselves, we, as we lift, it feels better. Mm. So our outlook, our expectations, how we carry ourselves. And so with all the things that can go into it, I've kind of come to look at depression as a syndrome. And it's kind of a, a group of symptoms that will require a group of interventions. Depression is not a one-size-fits-all thing where I get this one thing, um, this one thing happens and I'm all better. So let's look at the symptoms. And there's a lot. Mm. There's how the mood is and that and it's the idea of persistence. It lasts. And anxiety can go with depression. So you can feel anxious or you can feel empty, hopeless, pessimistic, guilty, worthless, helpless. Loss of interest, and this is really important, the things that you used to do, you're just not interested anymore. Mm. And just being aware of that, the, the idea of decreased energy, fatigue, feeling slowed down, I just can't get going. Mm -hmm. Concentration, really hard to, the, the brain gets involved and it's having trouble remembering, and we'll talk about memory a little bit later. But just even depression, um, decision making is a challenge. Insomnia, waking up really early or oversleeping or sleeping too much, sleeping during the day, not be able to get to sleep at night. Appetite, weight loss or overeating, it can be either. And more seriously, Thoughts of death or suicide, or, or certainly the worst, making an attempt. Mm. Restlessness and irritability, and you see this a lot in teenagers. They tend to be, um, they show more irritability often than they do the, the sad, depressed state. And then physical symptoms, things that just you know, you don't know where they're coming from, all kinds of reasons. You go to the doctor and they're not diagnosed. So these symptoms that were listed, I found them on ADAA, just to understand anxiety and depression. Um, it's also under, important to understand that the truth is these symptoms can indicate there are other things besides depression. And so you want to rule out a medical condition. And I have an example of I had a friend who turned into a really unhappy, irritable bear. Yeah. And it wasn't until she was diagnosed and treated for an overactive thyroid that things started to calm down and she, would, she returned to herself. So thyroid conditions can change things. There are lots of things that can change. So it's important to have a, a good medical um, examination and and talk about all the things that are going on. Yeah. Okay, so what causes depression? I mentioned grief, grief and loss. Um, there's just some times in our lives when the loss seems bigger than we can bear and it lasts for a a long time, but I have a hard time saying two weeks and you should get over it. You know, the death of a parent, God forbid, the death of a child. These are things that are 
um, the closer the person is to us, the longer it's going to take to get over that. And to expect someone to snap out of it is unfair. And oftentimes we expect ourselves to snap out of it. May I ask a question about that, Meg? Sure. I have lots of, I'm writing down questions furiously. I don't want to interrupt because I'm, I'm sure you're, you may be going to answer some. But as far as earlier you said, if somebody is suffering from grief, a loss, you know, the loss of a parent or, as you said, God forbid, a child, well, that's understandable that they would be upset and grieving. But if that goes on too long, and who can say how long it's going to go on, right? Right. But that could clinically then turn into depression because they will stop making the serotonin that they need? Is that um, with that? Yeah, pretty much. And the thing is with that, just <laughs> understanding that um, it's, it's necessary because, because I'm grieving, um, doesn't mean I should stop living and so we have to kind of rely on our support system and I'll talk a little bit about that to um, to get us moving and not that we want people to say snap out of it but that we do have to keep moving we have to keep moving forward and living our lives so that we can get the chemicals working the way they need to but some people absolutely collapse yeah and they just you know they can't get up and that doesn't mean that the only way that they can recover is through medication it just means that maybe this is just going to take longer and that's okay yeah and giving that permission and um, I want to talk a little about that because I've seen this in the even in the last couple of weeks um, I've heard more than three people talk about unresolved sadness and grief and say I didn't have time to feel it hmm. and that's that's our culture I don't have time I just got to keep moving well uh, I've got to keep moving and if I'm going to suppress that and we're understanding now that emotions are chemicals they're neurotransmitters that are, are, that run through our body that um, Chinese medicine understands um, that's where we get a lot of our understanding from they say the the lungs hold grief that the liver holds um, anger the gallbladder holds resentment and what that makes sense if you think about well there's a chemical and that chemical gets stored in different places and yeah. so we have to we have to be able to release the emotion, process through it, right, and be able to let it go. That could become like a, a post traumatic stress if you hold that in, right? You don't right. You're looking that. at the next thing, prolonged stress. Oh, okay. Absolutely. And there are you know, there's one thing of having the, the deadlines of work and job and I got to do the dishes and the laundry and all of that stuff. But to be under pressure for a long period of time can turn into, if not the disorder, the, the precursors of post-traumatic stress. And certainly when you talk about people who have, uh, are in abusive relationships and don't see a way out and that now we're talking stress, chronic stress. So there's lots of ways that we can stay in stress. We have to move. Um, one of the first things I learned way back in grad school, they used to say that depression was anger turned inside. Hmm. And you think about anger, someone who um, in a healthy way expresses anger, because anger is not a bad thing, it's, rage is not good. But anger is, is what motivates us. It gets us moving. But if we feel helpless, if we feel out of control, that, or that we don't have control, rather, then that's going to bring some anger. And if I don't have an outlet for it, I'll turn it inside. I'll just stuff it because mm. I can't do anything in it. I'm in a job, and my boss is really miserable, and I really hate this job, but I need the paycheck, so I'm just going to shut up. Yeah, but, but there's no outlet. We need outlets for our emotions. 
worry, 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 worry. Mm. The people that are really good at worry, that's, and we'll talk about the brain in a little bit, and that just can take us down. It's that outlook, Eeyore. Negative self-talk kind of goes along with chronic worry, only the negative self-talk is often people saying things like, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve this. In, in the sense of I don't deserve good things. Mm. So these are some of the things that cause it. Then we have to look at medication. Somebody can be on a medication, not for depression, but for something else, and it can cause depression because the body is this delicate balance. A medical condition can cause depression. And then there's the stuff we don't know. Um, genetics. People that, um, if there's a family history of depression and anxiety, those things kind of show up. So that we don't know all the causes of depression, but we g you can get a good idea of what some of them are. Yes. Before we move on, I want to talk about substance abuse. One of the reasons that so many people are on medication for depression is because as a culture, we're always looking for the quick fix. And many people try whatever they can to just feel better fast, like right now, please. Mm. So, and it's ironic that many people, especially men, turn to alcohol when they feel depressed. And the irony is that alcohol is a depressant. In small quantities, it may loosen inhibitions, and somebody, but when somebody feels really bad, a little is never a, enough. Yeah. And you can't give the nervous system a boost with a depressant. So the depression becomes more insidious, more severe, more in there, and you get a cycle. Now there's my friend marijuana. I used to, like I said, I, I used to work with teens. And invariably, those that were involved in, you know, um, getting arrested for marijuana and things like that, they would always say that how it helped was that it helped when they were stressing. And so they were essentially self medicating. Mm. And that's the problem. The problem is that it often helps. Right. And it helps in the short term, because, and that's why people use it. Right. But if you don't learn to manage stress and distressing feelings, the problems not only remain, but then they become deeply entrenched because you keep covering them over with the substance. Makes sense. And then we get into the other side of things that substance abuse, sub abuse of any substance, um, can le lead to depression and, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Remember the drugs mess with that delicate serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine balance. So addicts will sometimes tell you they don't do drugs to feel good, they do drugs to keep from feeling bad. Mm. So that self-medication is um, something that happens all the time. Okay, so now that we're just cl clinically depressed, what do we do? <laughs> so if we decide that the quick fix method is just masking, masking the problem, and whether you take medication for depression or um, illicit substances or legal substances, you're still masking the problem. So if we want to make real lasting changes, there are some things we can do. So I really like this quote because it comes from someone who has suffered his own out with depression. He knows it from the inside out. And so I really recommend his book, Unstuck, Your Guide to the Seven Stage Journey. And he was actually in medical school when he suffered a serious clinical depression and then years later he wrote the book and so he's saying depression is not a disease it's a wake-up call and the start of a journey that can change and transform our lives so here's where the rubber meets the macadam mm. change transformation that's scary yeah 
if you really feel depressed, the idea of putting effort into anything seems impossible. It's just, it feels overwhelming. And depression does not tell the truth. It lies. It says to us, we can't. We're not worthy. The things that run through the depressed mind seem true, but they're not. And one of the first things to, that we have to learn to do is challenge those lies. And that's one area where a good counselor can come in and, and help to bring in some reality. It's also important to remember that not all of our thoughts are truths. You know, yeah. like Mark Twain, many of us have spent a lot of time worrying about things that never happened. Mm. You know, so we, we have to look at those things, manage those things. Okay, now we come into a tiny little bit of neuroscience. Okay. Okay. So here's some brain information to remember. That yellow and ooh, look at that I can highlight oh. that right where the uh, <laughs> right where that yellow is that's called the prefrontal cortex and there's one on the right side and on the left side now the um, and and I also I always think that this is God's little joke because this is the last part of the brain to um, to wire itself and this is where the decision-making process is called the executive function is over here so I work with teenagers um, who are not you know this isn't wired very well for them so to but remember that that poor, it's poor decision-making poor decision-making exactly okay. And, you know, they would invariably go home and say, well, Meg said that my brain's just not working. <laughs> and I said, yes, and it's like a muscle. You have to exercise it. So, And by that, you mean for them to start making decisions? To be, to be aware of it, first yeah. of all, is important. That's fascinating, really. That's a fascinating piece of information for people dealing with teenagers. Yeah, it's important to understand that because, you know, they're not trying to be stupid. Right. They just, right. <laughs> they, you know, that impulse gets there much faster yeah. than the, the decision like, hmm, maybe this is not a good idea. So, okay. So we've got the right brain and the left brain. And um, one of the things that we found out was that the, um, the left side seems to have a more positive outlook than the right side and it's interesting because the um, how they found this out with was with stroke victims people who had damage to the right which meant their their left lobe was good they tended to you know be able to take things in stride better but people who had damage to the left and were only activate only working off the right had that Oh, woe is me, and, and that real pulled down idea. So knowing that the two parts of the brain work together and the, the right um, brain is really important, um, and oftentimes we get too much in our left brains because that's the analytical, analyzing, thinking part, um, and the right brain is more emotional. Okay. So, but the right brain has an access to those negative emotions and the left brain is able to kind of think into positive emotions more easily and the right brain tends to be passive where the left brain is active and that's how we activate it through activity Oh, very interesting okay so Moving on here, so how do we do that? There are lots of things to do to shift the brain into a feel-good state. And this one almost seems silly, to act as if. Act as if you're in a good mood. Well, in recovery, in addiction recovery, they say, fake it till you make it. And there's something to that. Remember, if you're carrying yourself in a way that says, I'm okay, your body starts to believe it. Your brain starts to believe it. And there's a line from Thich Nhat Hanh that I love very much that says, sometimes our joy is the source of our smile. Mm. Oh. And 
sometimes our smile is the source of our joy. Mm. So smiling can take us there. That's a way to prime a positive mood. Who said that, Meg? Thich Nhat Hanh. Okay. He's a um, Buddhist teacher. That's beautiful. Okay, now here we are at the beginning of winter. <laughs> These <laughs> lovely short days when the light is low, days are short. Um, and if you notice, depression gets worse this time of year. It's not just about the holidays, it's about these are the shortest days. Mm -hmm. And for those who seem to get that, who find themselves um, shifting into that, um, it's, imp it's important to consider getting full spectrum lighting. Those therapy lights, they really work. I have a friend who um, has her breakfast in front of, of one of those therapy lights every single day and it's changed her life since then and she's been doing it for years. But she used wow. to str really struggle with depression. Exercise! Get that norepinephrine going and get active to activate that left prefrontal cortex that we talked about. Exercise is really important and boy is it hard when you are depressed. And um, one of the things in um, James Gordon's book about Unstuck, he said sometimes you need to just, you know, um, plan to exercise and then the first step is just getting out your clothes and getting out your sneakers. And maybe the next day is just putting on the sneakers and, and cutting yourself some slack to understand that we what we're doing is is fighting inertia. Oh, and another word about exercise is that um, because we're fighting in inertia, an exercise buddy, somebody to call us and say, hey, let's go for a walk. So having a support system that can kind of get us moving. And this next one, constructing narratives. Oh, the stuff we tell ourselves. <laughs> the scripts we run. I mean, they really impact our mood. And this is one place where emotional freedom techniques can really be helpful. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So changing how we, say, changing that self-talk. Taking action, not just exercise, but moving. Um, there's a pile, oh, I'm depressed, I haven't gotten to my bills, I've got mail that I haven't answered. Take action, you know, just go to the pile of mail and open up one piece of mail. And look at the to-do list and what's the easiest thing that you can do. And even if it's do part of it. And then once you start moving, then you build a little momentum. And then it becomes a little bit easier. And then wiring positive thoughts. Recognizing and changing those cognitive distortions, that, that self-talk. Remember, depression lies. Mm. So when we, this is awful, this is the worst thing that could ever happen, you know, go, wait a minute, that's right, depression lies, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to stop and breathe, <laughs> always a good place to start, right. and then say, maybe that's a challenge, maybe that's a, a lie. And maybe I can challenge that lie. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, maybe then I need to talk with a counselor. Yeah. We, we believe those lies so much, though. When we're, when we're depressed, it seems like the absolute truth. It's exactly true. Yeah. 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 I mean, things that you're saying, you know, uh, just getting up, moving, exercising will create breathing, you know, and the breath will... Uh, will help with your brain and all of those things and you know getting outside even you can't uh, you can't claim it's too cold out to walk right it's not, the, not right now no. out, so, yeah I, I think about the the Waldorf school um, those kids are out in all weather mm. 
It's never too well. You know, I may there may be a day where it is too cold when the you know if the wind chills down to twelve below, but right. generally they are out every single day, rain or shine. Wow. Okay, so the the last getting positive is about social medicine. Um, we need to raise the dopamine. You know, we need dopamine to feel good. And that's what we get from people. We also get hugs give us oxytocin, which is a good thing. And even introverts, you know, because I, I you know, work with people that are introverts and, what, you know, I'm not comfortable around people. Well, even introverts need to be around people. We're social animals and we need our pack. And if we don't have a pack, that leads to depression. Mm. Um, one of my, um, a woman that I worked with for a long time really battled depression and alcoholism and it really, it became really hard for her as everybody in her life that mattered was gone. And she was an older woman and just, she just, she didn't have a support system anymore. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. So, and, and our culture really doesn't support the elderly, you know, uh, we, yeah. we don't, we warehouse them, unless they have money, and then we put them in cool places. Yes, and they get to go in really cool places, yeah. Yeah. So, another book that I highly recommend is called Rewire Your Brain by its neuropsychologist John Arden, and not only does he give these great suggestions, but he discusses also how diet impacts mood. Mm. And speaking of diet, some research has found that vegetarians report it being less optimistic about the future than meat eaters. And they were more likely to report depression and to suffer panic attacks and anxiety. So there's some, you know, there are things that we get that vegetarians may not be getting if they're um, not getting enough meat or the whatever the things are and that is totally out of my realm of expertise so I just mentioned you know learn more about it and John Arden talks about it and there's new stuff coming out every day when you say you're when you say a pack you're packed like people need packs that doesn't necessarily mean your family you're you could have a you know maybe you don't get along with your family members but that's a really that's a really good point. Some families are, I'm sorry to say, too toxic to yes. to be around. But finding people that you connect with, and it doesn't have to be a whole lot of people, you know. But just having social interaction, getting out there, meeting people. And we have things like Meetup, where you can yeah. find so many things online that everybody's got an interest in something, and you can connect. Mm -hmm. So. As much as people decry social media and the internet and things, there are some real positive things that can happen. But being in the presence of someone is not the same as connecting online. But if online is all you got, it's better than nothing. It's better than sitting with the covers over your head. Right. So one of the areas that is my level of expertise is about sound and, and music. And there are, um, not too long ago, I, I worked with someone who, he just didn't want to do the emotional work. You know, there was, there was stuff there. There was trauma, but he didn't want to go there. So I said, you know what? Hum. Just hum. And what that does is creates a buzz inside the body, it, a resonance. If you do that for a while, it starts to build up. And I learned um, years ago that I could manage pain with the sound of my voice. And at that time, my theory was that I was um, getting endorphins, releasing endorphins, and that's been proven. So you can get endorphins going simply by humming, sing, chant, same kind of thing. And even for people who don't sing, everybody can sing. It, you know, it's not about uh, performing. It's about the expression and just letting things out and sounding the voice. The voice is very powerful and very helpful in the healing process. 
and sometimes we can sing or chant the the things that are bothering us just to get it out just to say it that's a great idea mm -hmm. and then one of my favorites is drum drumming there's a lot of uh, information about how drumming can help people that are feeling depressed it just gets you energized it gets you going and dancing put on some music and just if only you you know just stand there and sway or tap your toe you know and then maybe your shoulder will move a little bit you know <laughs> and maybe that'll move and just you know it doesn't have to be real big start out real small which is why I like the hum because it's real quiet you can hum and nobody really hears it and it's just a steady sound and you can hum out of tune and you can well actually um, if you're humming, there's only one sound, so it's your tune, whatever. Yeah, that's you, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever you choose it to be. Yeah. Okay. How about whistling? Um, it doesn't have the same impact. It it reaches higher frequencies, but it doesn't create that that resonance, that that feeling of the vibration. Okay. And um, another piece that's important. One of the they recently did a study about um, chanting Om and that what that does is activates the vagus nerve and I haven't talked about the vagus nerve but it's um, it's really important in in all of this especially in stress that um, it's the where the vagus nerve enters the body the vagus nerve takes information in from everywhere and feeds it in from, from the gut and it feeds it into the uh, the brain stem where the switches between the um, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. the sympathetic nervous system is the fight-or-flight stress activation and the parasympathetic is oh everything's okay I'm good let's go eat mm -hmm. And so we shift back, we should be able to get shift back and forth. And the vagus nerve, when things when you calm things down, like humming, like breathing, like chanting Om, it says to the um, the vagus nerve says to that part of the brain, it's okay. Mm. And we start to relax and let go. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so let's move on to anxiety. Can I ask you one question about sound? Mm -hmm. Is it true that sound was the first form of healing? Um, I read that somewhere. It would make sense that it was. I mean, it's the ears are the the first thing to develop the auditory system, rather is the first thing to develop in our brains so babies are hearing before they're doing anything else hmm. and yeah I mean if, if you look at indigenous cultures sound is so much a part of their healing process their healing rituals and um, oh you'll, you'll have to invite me back to talk about sound because yes, I'm fascinated by the subject. <laughs> <laughs> I did read what I re read and it was from a very long time ago that you could heal or kill actually kill somebody by intoning uh, a certain sound well um, yeah yes and no um, I th first of all there's a thing called a resonance resonant frequency and um, when you look at that what that term means um, that's a term that's used in physics when when they build a bridge they need to know what the resonant frequency is so that um, when you get vibration going mm -hmm. if the amplitude if it gets too high too loud um, the bridge will break apart oh right yeah so the the belief is that um, I mean this is where the Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho the walls came tumbling down oh, right. because they encircled they they played horns going around and around the walls and that created a resonant frequency and that's how the walls could have come tumbling down yeah and is it real or is it Memorex right that, <laughs> that commercial where the glass broke right 
yeah. yeah you have to have you have to have the right frequency but to be able to actually um, disintegrate a human being um, that that's some some kind of power that that's I'm not interested in looking know, into. Yeah, I don't know if they would, okay. would, could induce a heart attack or something, but they could cause harm or, as I said, heal a person through sound. Right. Very interesting. Okay. So, moving on. Mm. <laughs> when we talk about anxiety, we want to look at um, what's the difference between fear and anxiety and the idea is that fear tends to be about something specific oh look there's a really big spider <laughs> or I have to give a speech in class anxiety is a, that uneasy feeling something's wrong or gonna go wrong maybe there are spiders or snakes or the roof will fall in or I'll lose my job or someone will get in an accident you know things you just on top of each other and someone who knows how to worry about everything, sees the potential for danger everywhere, they'll probably live in a constant state of anxiety. And I know people like that. I know people who just one thing happens and will take it to the extreme. Um, if I hear a siren, my house is burning down. And they just go to the rock that extreme right away so we have to be careful about that right because chronic stress is going to make you jumpy mm. and anxious okay why it's doing that I don't know <laughs> all right so we're going to come back to a little bit more of uh, neuroscience and I'll make it real quick there's something called an HPA axis and it's between the hypothalamus the intuitary, anterior pituitary and the adrenal cortex. So two things in the brain, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, and then the adrenals are on top of the kidneys. There will not be an exam following this, and you <laughs> won't have to um, identify them on a chart anywhere. It's just okay. important to know that one thing leads to another. We get the hypothalamus. Its job is to maintain balance, homeostasis and it gathers information from the central nervous system and it releases neurohormones that talk to the pituitary and they tell those hormones say you need to start secreting or stop secreting your hormones one of the hormones that the pituitary sends out is ACTH we don't have to pronounce it and that stimulates the adrenal, adrenal glands and it says make cortisol mm. and it's cortisol that creates that jittery scared feeling and it's some and it sometimes it feeds back to the thalamus and the pituitary because that's information I feel jittery so something's wrong so I'm gonna make more cortisol and it just we just go in a cycle until something steps in to say hey it's safe now so cortisol in small doses it's a really good thing because we need it if there really is an actual threat we need to be able to um, dodge the car that need you know almost hit us um, but if that is happening all the time, it depletes dopamine. Remember, one of those three magic neurohormones, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. Then, if it's prolonged, cortisol starts to shut down a place called the hippocampus, and that's the place where we build memories. So it affects memories. That's why it's really hard to remember things when we're stressed. Oh. The other side of it is that the hippocampus shuts down, but this little guy called the amygdala, or two little guys, get hypersensitized. So the little red dots in here, those are, we got one on each side, that's the amygdala. And they sit on top of this thing called the hippocampus and that becomes important when we talk about trauma. Um, the amygdala primarily deals with the emotions of fear and anger. And 
because it's in top of the hippocampus about memories, um, if I have a traumatic experience with a spider or a car accident or abuse and something happens, I see a big spider or a car comes close to hitting me or someone yells at me just like my abuser did, then the amygdala will start to react to the memory. And it's reacting to the, the it, there's a go-to reaction to those things. And the more traumatic the history, the more reactive somebody becomes. So we need to calm the amygdala. And one of the ways is to start to get a conversation going with that prefrontal cortex that we talked about before. Get a pathways going. So some things are at play, like take action. And the first action is to breathe and to so, do some self-talk to just say, oh, wait a minute, this feels like that, but this isn't that, and I'm safe. This may feel like um, that person who yelled at me when I was in third grade and made me embarrassed and afraid to um, say what I'm thinking, or that's, that's not this, and I'm safe. And this constant idea of safety because we all have these brains that were um, developed from other brains. The template, the DNA template has been to have a very hypersensitive, ready for threat, understanding where, you know, where's the threat because the other shoe's going to drop somewhere because that's how, where's, in, and it comes back from where was the tiger? Where's the tiger? Um, I got to be safe. And so those that ability to be on guard is easy to um, be at play here. So using breath and self-talk. And there's a point in the middle of the breastbone, right smack dab in the middle, and there's a hollow there. So it's a, a place to, we actually, when you point to yourself, it's kind of like right where we go. And a lot of the acupressure points are, are intuitive. And this is the point that if you press in and you hold it and you breathe, and then you start to say something like, I'm safe now, I'm, it's okay. You know, I'm looking around, there aren't any snakes, there aren't any spiders, there's nobody here, I'm okay. And that self-talk starts to create a connection with the prefrontal cortex that says, yep, everything's okay, it's okay to relax. And so we start to, to create a better, um, a, we interrupt the short circuit that happens when the amygdala reacts to something like an old memory. And so we get our thoughts involved in it. That sounds a little bit like the tapping. It does. <clears throat> and the, the tapping, and, and we're kind of at the, the end of things. So um, I got into, um, actually I started as a music therapist, and my job turned me into a social worker slash counselor. And then I learned this thing called emotional freedom techniques. And... Um, this is a way to work with the meridian system to calm your system down with uncomfortable, whatever the uncomfortable emotions are. People who have unresolved sadness, we can, we can get that, find out the things that are holding us back. Usually we don't uh, resolve so sadness because there's some kind of um, unconscious belief about it. Same thing with anger. I can't let go of this, or I don't want to. And so the um, the work that I enjoy is the detective work about what is that? What's what's the the belief that's going on that keeps me stuck in that that holding pattern? And how do I release it? And once we release it, it's it's pretty it's um, unbelievable how quickly. And um, the most recent event that I had was I had a woman who came to me. Um, 
um, her her daughter found me in the Natural Awakenings magazine, and she called and she said, "I'm really worried about my mother." And the mother called me and she said, "I'm really scared. I've never been like this before." And she came in, and the very first session, we found out that there was unresolved grief and anger, and we cleared it. And then the next session, we did some check-in to make sure that that was clear and it was still holding. And she found another event in her life where there was some deep sadness. And we cleared that. And then the third session, we focused on making concrete steps to um, clean out a place that had gotten in her, in her office that had gotten out of control. Mm. And the only reason she came back for the fourth session was because she felt obligated to because she scheduled it. But she said she was fine. She was back to doing the things that she wanted to do. Wow. And this was through emotional freedom technique. That was the primary mover in that particular case. And that's not always the case with people. Sometimes it really is a lifestyle thing. Diet is off. Exercise is off. Mm -hmm. Attitude is off. You know, There's a whole right. bunch of things that are out. And one but, leads to the other and to the other to the other. Exactly. Yeah. Can you just explain explain, explain emotional freedom technique a little bit? Well, um, some people call it meridian tapping. And basically the idea is that you find the feeling, identify the feeling, and then you tap on specific acupoints or meridian points. And during the process of the tapping, the, the feeling, the um, the energetic charge starts to dissipate. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly I can think about that thing and I don't have that zzz feeling that I was having. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And um, another thing, vibra I do vibroacoustic therapy and brainwave entrainment because sometimes people are just locked into what's known as a beta pattern, especially people that are thinking all the time, they're ruminating about this and that and the other thing, and they're depressed except the brain is going nonstop. And helping to shift into a slower brainwave state. And the first state that someone has to get into is an alpha, going from beta to an alpha state. And breathing and, and some of the uh, tapping techniques and also just acupressure will help to, to get that to happen. But some people um, experience, you know, find that the brainwave entrainment really helps them to disengage from the, the thoughts. That sounds... Um, that sounds fascinating and wonderful because so many people are wired so wired today uh, so yes. that, that's what we're we can implement something like this to kind of shut our brains off at the end of the day and get some sleep yes yeah there there are lots of um, um, I'll put a plug in for my friend Jeff Thompson in California Center for Neuroacoustic Research um, it's his equipment that I use and I use a lot of his CDs and um, He's got a like a six CD thing where you can um, go from go get into alpha and then theta and then down into delta with the deep sleep, but also some other cool things in there as well. Okay. But what being able, to make? Jeffrey Thompson. Thank you. And um, being able to access these different brainwave states, you know, when we're kids, we can do them, and then. As we get older, we kind of forget how to do that. We kind of train ourselves to keep going, keep thinking, keep plowing through, and then the brain goes, "Huh?" <laughs> you know, and and you know, and that's a that's the downside of the left brain, where if you're thinking all the time, um, I liken it to you know, if somebody's doing a, a project and they're thinking about it and you know crunching numbers or writing something that's a very left brain activity and if you do that for a long period of time it's like hopping on one foot mm. so you have to stop and shift to into the right side and the right side is is more um, visual global um, art music those kinds of things um, 
you know, get up and stretch and turn on some music and dance and, and shift over into the right brain and just, you know, let go of the thinking. Yes, yeah. I, I, there's a little saying, I, I might not get it right, but it has something to do with um, human problems are caused by human thinking, something like that. And so if you continue to mentate and think about the problem or think, try to think about the solution, you're actually making it worse. So I think what you're saying, the same thing, just kind of shift over, let go of it, and allow for something else to come in. Right. Yeah, Einstein said we can't solve a problem at the same level of consciousness we created it. So it's a, or something to that effect. Right, exactly. It's the same. So if I'm if I'm in a worry state, then I'm not going to be able to problem solve my way out of that. Right. So yeah, and that's our natural kind of. Uh, that's what we do, right? I mean, we try to worry or think our way out of it. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, and and it's those aha moments usually happen in the transition time. Um, I think the story is that you know he was really working really hard at a mathematical problem and it wasn't until he put it down and went to get the bus that the or the trolley that the answer came to him mm. so that aha those aha moments come when we're um, are, as the brain relaxes the um, as uh, actually as it slows down the uh, we come to have more of a whole brain synchrony so that we have more access to more of the brain at one time mm. if so the more focused we are that's the you know um, I can't see the forest through the trees and sometimes I can't see you know anything but you know there's a groove and there's an ant and I can't even see that the tree yeah. anymore right. so to be able to pull back the lens slow the brain down and now I have access to more of my brain where there's other information and so that's what meditation does yes and so that this vibroacoustic it does it put you in somewhat of a meditative state taking you through the different stages yes and for people who have a hard time meditating this is a good way to kind of learn to retrain the brain how to do that oh that's how that feels okay and the vibroacoustic piece is that um, the chair or the bed are hooked up to the sound system and have transducers and they vibrate and so we're accessing that um, impacting that vagus nerve again which takes the information and says oh time to relax now mm. and so it helps to relax the body the nervous system and calm the, the whole brain and, and create more of a brainwave synchrony that sounds wonderful. And what are vocal energetics? Well, that's using the voice in a, a variety of different ways. I mentioned before that I, I, I use my voice for humming and I learned how to manage pain. Um, I, I stressed out, I burned out of my first profession and there was a lot of physical pain as a result of that. It was a very physical job and as I um, was recovering from that there was a lot of pain and I found that I before I went for aspirin or anything I would just hum and I could get a, a vibration going and then I learned that I could release emotional stuff that gets tied in there because when we're kids you know very often we're told to shut up or I'll give you something to cry about and, and we learn how to <laughs> put it inside and, and stuff it inside and the body you know holds on to that stuff and so this is about letting it go freeing it and um, becoming more um, just becoming more free yeah in our day-to-day -day lives yeah wonderful are these uh, modalities that you use are they well known I mean, it sounds like they should be used everywhere <laughs> you know I'm, I'm I mean, agree. Yes. In, our, in our prison systems in our in our recovery houses in you know are these are these modalities being used? Um, I'll tell you that emotional freedom techniques is finally getting some traction, and and also to understand that EFT is a the emotional freedom text EFT is a is kind of like the tip of an iceberg that is a brand new field called energy psychology, oh. which works with 
the body's meridian system, the chakras, the biofield, mm. with intention, with understanding that we're energetic beings. And so, um, you know, even a year ago, I would have said, you know, there's, there's some um, evidence for um, e EFT, but there's there's more. There's this the science behind all of this is becoming known, and when these things started, I mean, there's always you know the naysayers, and you know seriously, if I said to you, here, um, you're really angry, you you want to kill your wife, um, let's tap on that, <laughs> and in five minutes, you're not going to remember why you were so angry. Yeah. Um, that's unbelievable. Yet I've had that experience. I, I bet had it. You, have. Yeah. you know. So, and and that's what drew me to it. I had my own experience of having a panic attack, and that's a long story. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a panic attack, and and I remembered that I had learned this thing called the FT, and I sat there and used it, and suddenly I wasn't panicked anymore, and I knew that what. I thought um, I thought I had burned down my house because I left a, a brand new curling iron on, um, and on a newspaper on my dresser, on my wooden dresser. Oh wow! And that was three weeks after I got back in my house from a neighbor having a fire. So oh boy, <laughs> it wow. was the perfect storm. Yeah. And um, and we, you know, I said, well, the concert's almost over. Why ruin it for other people? Whatever happened, happened. And I was very matter-of-fact by it. And that, so a part of me is going, wow, this is really working. And then the, I took it into a school um, that Monday, and I had a, a teen who was, I was supposed to see her, and she was already in the counseling department because she had gone off on a student, had a fight with a peer. And she was at the level of an eight of anger, and we use a scale of zero to ten, and she's at an eight, and within ten minutes she's at a two. Wow! And I said, "Oh, this stuff works. I need to know more." And that's wow. that was in in 1999. Wow! So fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So if somebody were to call you, um, these are some of the modalities that you use um, when dealing with mm -hmm. clients. Okay. Right. Yeah, and we've got your website up there and your email and your phone number. Right. The best way can... for people to contact you is what? Um, call or send an email. I respond or send a text. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, eventually, you know, we'd want to talk, but um, you can send me an email and say, when's a good time to reach you? Okay. You know, that kind of thing. So... All right. Yeah, I'm pretty available. All right, good. Let's get to some questions. Um, can you do this by phone, or um, I don't know if you can do the EFT by phone, but could you do yeah. any other therapies by phone? Yes. Well, I, I can't do the vibroacoustics. Right. Right. I mean, with my license, I can counsel somebody in the state of Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, so yes, I could do counseling, and I do. I do phone work, and I also do Skype or um, Zoom or or whichever. Um, um, so it it's surprisingly effective. I was skeptical initially, but um, I worked with a woman for over a year before I actually saw her in person. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, you've got to love technology, you know. Really, yeah, it's, there's, it's there's a lot. Opening up so, and especially for somebody who's depressed, you know, like for somebody can that you can't turn on the computer. House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the first question from Kristen. What type of tests are done to find out cortisol levels, etc., that may be causing the feeling of depression? That's that you have to talk to a doctor about. Oh, okay. that's my, not my area of expertise. I will tell you that Dr. Tom Wachtman at um, Twin Ponds Integrative Health Center has a questionnaire that he uses with people to kind of help sort that out. And I've heard that there are saliva tests and urine tests. And um, I, my understanding is that the um, saliva test might be more accurate. The blood doesn't necessarily show our cortisol levels, and urine doesn't necessarily. But I know that some people are using that, but I have no personal experience with that. 
Okay. I know that there's some neurotransmitter testing out there and right things like that. And I know Dr. Tom does the uh, organic acids uh, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And I had had a question um, about um, diet and lifestyle. You know, especially diet. If we're putting in all of this, you know, uh, non-organic pesticide or GMO uh, food that's not clean you know not real food that mm -hmm. certainly has to be affecting our brain uh, well and I'll add to that yeah which is people that are that obsess about it you know and I know that there's a we need to consider that and we need to work to get those things changed but somebody who's obsessed about that and and worried about that constantly that's going to you know that could create as much depression and anxiety as the actual substances. That's a very interesting point. People used to ask me if I, they could drink coffee, you know, like coffee was a no-no. And I, and I said, well, if you're going to drink the coffee and enjoy it, then go ahead and do it. But if you're going to be stressed out about it, then don't drink it. It's not worth it. The stress over worrying about it is going to be worse than the coffee. Exactly. What's yeah. what's the story we tell ourselves? If I say to myself, mm -hmm. you know what, I can have a cup of coffee in the morning and I'm going to be fine, right. then I'm telling, I'm giving my my brain messages that say I can be fine with this. Okay. Interesting point. Uh, so, Kristen had asked, do you recommend counseling from the beginning or only after altering lifestyle with diet and exercise? I, I think that's a, a personal choice. You know, if if you realize that um, some of the the thoughts are getting in the way, um, and and there might have been some life events that have have triggered this, um, even if you suspect it, you might want to, you know, start the counseling just to. Um, just to get it going and and actually and I would recommend someone who who does what I I do along the lines of this isn't um, I say this isn't your mother's therapy this isn't let's sit and talk and dredge it out and talk about it for 27 weeks this is you know what's going on and and let's clear it like I said that the woman who you know after three sessions she really was fine now that's that's an unusual case but um, I have worked with people, you know, for as little as six to twelve sessions, and um, and they're done. Wow. It, it depends on the, you know, um, we all have stories, and some stories are are a little more intense than others. Right. Yeah, but I love that you're actually you're dealing with it and mm -hmm. letting it, working through it, and letting it go, not just rehashing and rehashing. Exactly. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. Jan asks, are you familiar with whole tones? Oh, I'd have to know more about the, the context. Um, I, yeah, because if you, if you say whole tones, um, I, I don't know what that means. I know there's things out there like the solfeggio, and I'm, um, I take that with a huge grain of salt. Um, Simply because I'm not sure how they came to um, to identify those tones and how they say they identified them from chanting. Well, how do they know? Well, you know. Um, so I'm skeptical. I'm open-minded, but I'm also um, skeptical. But whole tones, just by itself, that um, I don't know what that refers to. Okay, and it's I don't I've never heard of it either, and it's all, it's spelled all one word, whole tones. W W H O L E tones. Yeah, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, I'll look it up though now. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, what What about tests for depression? I, uh, for example, the Beck Depression Scale. Do you oh use yeah. Those? Um, <laughs> I have used it in the past, and. Um, find it valuable some people kind of need that to to have a gauge of this is where I've started um, and yeah I the, the cognitive piece I mean that's the one thing that the the gift of the Beck inventory um, and and Beck's work is really that cognitive approach um, as much as the emotional piece is in there 
um, it's very much a, a mental emotional situation and you have to deal with both okay one other question can you explain the difference between endogenous and exogenous depression hmm well um, by virtue I mean it's not a term I'm familiar to using but just by virtue of endogenous means inside so it might be something that's going on inside that's created the depression and um, the exogenous would be outside the body so it might be that situation that we can't control um, or something you know that we ingest that creates it so you know a medication that creates it something that's out but endogenous would be something's going on inside that and it could be in a, a mental state, it could be an emotional state, or it could be, you know, there really is something that went wonky with, you know, the, the neurotransmitters. Right, yeah, that sounds, you know, it seems like a very delicate balance, that with your adrenals and your thyroid. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah. It's surprising we feel as good as we do. Yeah, it, it really is, yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much for this information. Um, I've really enjoyed this. You've, you've uh, given us some, I think, some mm -hmm. tools that we could implement right away, just faking it till we make it, getting up, <laughs> move, moving. Oh, it's a great one, right? I mean, yeah, it's, smile. Like, standing up when you're standing up straight, mm -hmm. you're breathing better, you're, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things. And so um, humming, I like that. Um, I'm going to start humming around the office. I, I do find that now that I have Pandora on in my office every day, I, I am much more productive and I um, my days are, you know, I'm happy. So, yeah, yeah it that's works. great. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm going to leave your um, contact information up there, but it's www.lrsoundenergy.com. The phone number is 610-504-4830. Or you can reach Meg at Meg at lrsoundenergy.com. Meg, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So next month on January 27th, we'll be talking about uh, detoxification. We'll be uh, exploring ways to gently detox and how to lessen the load for uh, better health and vitality. This webinar from this evening will be archived in a day or two. You'll be able to find it on our web, uh, website. Mm -hmm. So I want to wish everybody a wonderful, happy holiday, a stress-free stress or a little less stressful holiday, and a uh, wonderful new year. Again, thank you, Meg, and good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>